This is the story of nuclear weapons and the Cold War. It should go without saying, nuclear secrets are secret for a reason. If you're an FBI agent or a NSA agent or an MI6 agent and you see something on this thing that you don't want being leaked, check Google. What can I say? I'm pretty sure like a couple, like two years ago, I must have put on this chat the instruction manual ingredients for a nuclear bomb. You just, you just offhandedly post the anarchist cookbook. Leaking nuclear secrets is turbo illegal and gets like every security service knocking your door at 3 a.m. Don't do it. I'm not gonna, you shouldn't either. Now that that's out of the way, we need to introduce two new measurements. The first one of these is the Snickers index. So it turns out that one gram of TNT has an explosive energy of one calorie. This means that a standard Snickers bar with 280 calories in it has the same explosive power as 280 grams of TNT. This will be the basis to measure our amount of energy, the number of Snickers bars. We will use these to make the numbers slightly easier to visualize for our coming nuclear weapons. Everybody's heard of the Tsar Bomba. Chances are you haven't heard of the, some of the smaller ones. We've all played Fallout. We all know the Fat Man. It's a shoulder-fired nuclear catapult and it launches mini nukes. It turns out the US invented something pretty similar. It's called the Crockett Rocket. It is a recoilless gun that fires miniature nuclear warheads. That little black thing with fins is a nuke. It had a range of two miles and it was planned to augment artillery in NATO, particularly along the Iron Curtain. It had a yield of 20 tons, which gives you a Snickers index of 71. Now that sounds small, but it is much, much more than conventional artillery. The weapon was praised for being an innovation in miniaturization. It was the first miniaturized nuclear warhead, and the principles it applied would later be reused in missiles and bombs and so on. I just, I just want to say uh, the the fact that that guy looks so nervous to like even touch it. To be fair, if someone <laughs> plopped it on your desk and said, "Yeah, here's a nuke," I yeah. don't I think he'd hear a nuke. <laughs> So radiation was actually quite low for the weapon, but it still required extensive safety procedures because, you know, if someone stole it, they have a nuke. And the documentation to operate it was, when I say pages long, I mean it would it would compare, it would rival, like, the Bible in length. It was fired in testing. This picture actually is an example of what it did when it was fired. Jeez. <laughs> now, what does Helldivers have to do with anything? This, which is a mini-nuke artillery shell. It turns out Helldivers didn't invent nuclear artillery. So... Here we have a video, and I want you to see what you can see. It fires, whatever. Whatever, it blasts a nuke, you know. This is the M65 atomic cannon. Unfortunately, Atomic Annie, as it was known, was not in service for very long. It was extremely heavy. The shell was not compatible with anything else, so it could, it could only be fired from Atomic Annie. So a couple other ones came out around the same time. One of these is the W48 artillery fired atomic projectile. It was much lighter, but its yield was also much lower, with just 100 tons. There are a few kinds of radiation. It's not all just one monolithic thing. There's alpha radiation, beta radiation, gamma, and then neutrons. Radiation is pretty toxic to people. And the fact that neutrons, as we saw before, go through basically everything, this means that you could use it to punch through armor of, say, something like a tank. 10 grays of radiation is generally considered to be fatal. How much is that in CPM? So this is part of the issue. Measuring radiation is really hard because nobody can agree on units. A Geiger counter measures counts, which literally is just how many times does a particle of radiation hit the counter. Most of the world uses grays, but the U.S. still uses something called rads, which you know from Fallout. Again, a thousand rads kills you. One gray is equal to a hundred rads. The bomb they put out could deliver a thousand grays of prompt radiation. So this bomb will dose the entire battlefield with a hundred times the lethal dose of radiation. This is a lot. So. Why on earth do you need that much radiation? Well, it turns out you need it to penetrate the armor of tanks. Tanks obviously have pretty thick armor, and that armor is steel. So the idea was the Soviets would use mass tank movements in the Cold War, and killing that many tanks is not easy with regular weapons. So if you just blast the field with radiation, it would kill the crew. But after about a day or two, the tanks would also would be fine. They, they wouldn't be radioactive anymore, and you could just haul out the dead crew, and now you have thousands of Soviet tanks for yourself. Over those two days, the bodies would not decompose because the bacteria would also be killed by the radiation. This was referred to as the capitalist bomb because the fact it was meant to kill people but not destroy property. The hell bomb. Hell never uses the hell bomb as a demolition weapon. And it turns out the US came with a similar idea, the atomic demolition munition. A few versions exist. They were called the ADM, the SADM, and the MADM. So it was intended to be used to destroy large infrastructure. That's things like bridges, tunnels, bunkers, and power stations. 
And these actually served up until like almost the 90s. Now, the weapon was designed to be laid and hidden. So you take it, bury it, basically, cover it with leaves and barbed wire. And you could set a timer for up to 21 days. It weighed 70 pounds, and this is it. And you see the handle and a zipper. Inside that box is a nuclear bomb. Try to get that for airport security. <laughs> Sorry, I just found it outside. So this yield was much smaller, but you could actually pick. You could pick anywhere between 10 and 1,000 tons. And 10 tons is, for nuclear weapons, very, very small. It's the same as just 35 Snickers bars. Even small for nuclear weapons, quote-unquote, is still really big. A 10-ton bomb that wasn't nuclear would be one of the biggest bombs under our country has. And this one was just carried by some guy. So this is how it was deployed with you. This is a Special Forces paratrooper. They strap it to your thighs. Well, there's a lot of training that happens before that, but yes, you eventually have to jump out of a plane with a giant bomb strapped to your nutsack. If you set the timer for the maximum amount of 12 hours, sometimes it detonates 13 minutes or earlier. This led to some people calling it a suicide mission, but officially you're supposed to set it and then run away. The US was not the only ones who came up with these kinds of weapons. The Brits developed something of their own called Blue Peacock. However, unlike the other two, this was meant to be buried and then set on a very long timer. One of the issues they had, unfortunately, was that Germany gets pretty cold in the winter. And because they used electronic methods, not mechanical, there was a risk the electronics would freeze. Somehow, they discovered that a chicken emits just enough body heat to make the electronics not freeze. So what they did was they built a nuclear weapon, put a chicken with eight days worth of food, water, and air into a chamber next to electronics, welded it shut, and said, all right, you got eight days. If an invasion happens within eight days, we're fine. Otherwise, got to do it again. So you know how, like, pigeons are really good at sending messages in World War One. The British were like, hell, but, like, a, a good aiming de device for a missile uh, would be good if it was guided by a pigeon. So they put a pigeon inside of the, uh, the missile, and it would poke at dots that would aim for specific targets, like boats and things like that. And we did, like, we, we did that shit because, yeah, we're insane. Speaking of the Brits, when it comes to nuclear testing, you tend to do it in wide, empty places that you don't have a lot valuable there. Great Britain is pretty small, and there's not much empty land available, certainly not enough to hold up a nuclear test. It turns out that just 9,000 miles away is a huge, remote, and empty island that has nothing important. Australia. <laughs> oh, Reggie Didge. So they, the Brits saw the Australian outback as perfect. It was remote, it was huge, it had nothing in it, and it had some pretty good weather most of the time. So the UK established three test sites, one of which was literally called Emu Field, presumably as revenge for the Emu War. Now, despite being largely ignored, Aboriginal people did live in the outback. Like, they do exist. People are there. And one of these people was a man by the name of Nayari Morgan. He saw a blinding flash of light, followed by a huge fireball and a gigantic mushroom-shaped cloud. Morgan had accidentally stumbled across Maralinga Field, the main testing site. This was his first interaction with, West, with the Western world at the time. And in an interview, he later stated that he believed it was his spirits rising to speak with him. So, quick side story. Around this time, the U.S. thought we should start testing our nukes underground. They came up with an idea of a test called Operation Plum Bob Pascal B. They buried a 300-ton yield bomb in a bunker underground, gave it a... Snickers index of about a thousand, and then they welded a one ton solid iron mantle cover over the top. They painted it bright pink and put a high speed camera pointing at it. After the detonation, it was nowhere to be found. Then they went to check the camera. They caught exactly one frame of the mantle cover moving. It was going at at least 41 miles per second, which is 141,000 miles per hour. Some people say that the forces from being instantly transported to 150,000 miles an hour from a standstill would vaporize the mantle cover. I call them non-believers. Outers. It's, it is significantly funnier to assume that a bright pink iron mantle cover was immediately launched into space and an alien planet will be kinetic missile striked by a iron cover launched in the 60s. Tim, how how high is space? Like, if, if, if this thing is going 41 miles per second, how long from this explosion to go off to this fucking manhole cover to be in space? One and a half seconds. <laughs> Wait, good <laughs> one. <laughs> wow. That's, That's fucking nuts. crazy. You know in Gmod when you, like, mesh things together and it just, like, flies off like in, in an instant? That's, like, how what I'm imagining. <laughs> If it's me looking down on me The world above must also be 
This could go on for infinity.